Good morning. Welcome to the Lowville Mennonite Church online worship service for August 2nd. I'm Associate Pastor Adam Hauser. I'm recording outside today, one, because it's a beautiful day out here, and uh, this is a nice shady spot in the DEC Arboretum, which is not very far at all from our actual church location. And uh, partly because it's a beautiful day out here, nice to be outside. Uh, also, we are going to be starting, we are starting today, a new worship series about reconciliation. And uh, one of the themes in that is reconciliation with God's creation. And so being outside is fitting in that way. But it also is a bit of a precursor to what we are planning for which is to have an outdoor worship service on August 16th. So we are looking at uh, places to do that. It will likely be at Maple Ridge Center, but we don't know uh, quite yet. We need to uh, get those plans finalized, but we have two weeks to do that. Giving you some notice now that that's where we're going to be meeting and we'll see how that goes, whether we continue meeting outdoors or, or not. Uh, we will try to keep some sort of a, an online presence as well, so those of you that aren't able to make it out can still participate in some way. And uh, we are looking in consultation with council that uh, we will uh, look again towards the end of August about possibly meeting within our church building in September. But for now, it looks like the month of August we will continue to either be fully online or have uh, some options for meeting together outdoors. 
As I said, we're starting a new worship series, and this series is about reconciliation. And it is based on Palmer Becker. Uh, part of Palmer Becker's book, uh, What is an Anabaptist Christian? This is a book that our, our youth Sunday school class actually studied not too long ago. One of the sections in there uh, says that reconciliation is the center of our work. And as, as Anabaptists, that reconciliation is the center of our work. And to read now from these resources from MCUSA. Pastor and author Palmer Becker says that reconciliation is a distinctive characteristic of Christianity lived from an Anabaptist perspective. Over the next four Sundays, we will sing, listen, pray, confess, and testify to the gifts and challenges of reconciliation as a way of life. Reconciliation starts in God's great love for creation, for all the people of the world, and for every person who is created in God's image. Being mindful of this great love, today we worship God. We'll be looking at reconciliation with God, who through Jesus and the Holy Spirit has brought us deeper into God's unending love, mercy, and grace. For our call to worship this morning, I'll be reading as well, Hear, O people, our powerful, holy, merciful, and sovereign God is one. And we will love our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Do this, and you will live.
Hello, I'm Connie Zare, pastor of Care and Nurture at Loudville Mennonite Church, and I get to do the children's time today. You may notice that my hair is a little bit different today. My hair is getting longer and it's so hot, so I pulled it up in some ponytails. I needed three ponytails to hold it in, but then when I looked at it, I thought, this looks like when I was a little girl. I kind of look like a little girl again, kind of, but you know what it made me think? Even if I'm an old lady, God still thinks of me as a child. We are all God's children, no matter how old or how young we are, no matter where we live, no matter what we do, anything that, that we do, God still loves us and thinks of us as a child. So, that made me think about all of my animals I have and toys. Evelyn and Valerie, my granddaughters, are visiting this week. And so we got all of these stuffed animals and toys together. And we were playing with them. And it made me think again of being a little girl. Now look at this poor guy. See his poor neck? This is probably my only stuffed animal I had when I was a little girl. You've been with me so long, Greeny. Oh, but he's got a little bit of a, a loose neck, but that's okay. Anyway, and then I have a bunch of stuffed, uh, different Sesame Street things. Valerie particularly likes. Oh, hi! It's me! Abby Cadabby. And when Evelyn, before Evelyn was born, they made her, had her room all decorated in Winnie the Pooh. So I went to garage sales and thrift stores and bought all of the stuffed animals I could find that were Winnie the Pooh. I had two big garbage bags and these are what's left. And I have a trigger that bounces. Now he's fun, but he does not quiet down right away. Anyway, then I have some Maggie dolls. I have some camp dolls. I have some toys and animals that belong to Mina or Jared or Maggie when they were little. I have, how about this? Come over to my porch, we can do the chicken dance. Oops, hey, quiet. And Keith loves this cheetah. Anyway, I have all of these toys and they play with them when they come there all over the house and we have such a good time. But when it's time for bed, Evelyn has a blue bunny and Valerie has a little baby and they take those to bed with them. Um, let's see now. Well, that bunny was here. That bunny is blue. Hmm, I can't find the bunny. Oh no, and the baby, the baby's missing too. They were here before. Oh no, what am I going to do? They're going to be ready to take a net to, to go to bed soon and I'm not gonna have their, their bunny and their baby. Oh dear, I have to look for them. But you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a parable of Jesus. Remember that we talked about a parable is a story that Jesus tells. And this is called the story of the lost sheep. By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religious scholars were not pleased at all. They growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? And when you found it, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders. That's how they carried sheep sometimes. Rejoicing. And when you got home, you would call all your friends and neighbors and say, celebrate with me, I found my lost sheep. Yes, you would. And you know what? There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in no need of rescue. So if only one person from God's family would be missing, 
God would look and look and look until that person was found. And God will rejoice and celebrate when the person is found. It's also sort of like if, if all of my family was here and then say all of a sudden Keith was missing and we would just say, oh, too bad Keith isn't here. We don't know where he is, but let's go have some ice cream. No, we would not do that. We would say, let's go find Keith. We have to know where he is. So we would look and look and look and look until we found him. And then we would go have ice cream. So that reminds me again of looking that I have to go look for a baby and a bunny. Hmm. I wonder where they could be. Hmm. and then Keith made it into a puzzle. And we put it all together, but there is a piece missing. That reminded me of, remember when Keith talked just a few Sundays ago about the puzzle of our church that we have up. You might remember it. I know it's been a long time since you've been in, in, in the church building, but, but it was to show that every piece of the puzzle is important. Every person who comes to church is important. Everyone that God has made is important to him. And the story that I said was one sheep was missing. So the shepherd went to look for that one sheep. Now, Evelyn and Valerie 
why don't you come help me? We have to look for your bunny and your baby. Valerie and Evelyn, come help me. Let's go look. Valerie, you want to come help? Yeah. Let's go look. The bunny and the baby. Can Get anyone find them? Get my bunny. Oh, Evelyn found her bunny. Yeah. Yeah. It's rejoicing because a lost is found. Yay. For our pastoral prayer this morning, I would invite you to also take part in this prayer. When I say uh, the phrase, we pray together, I would invite you to also pray, God, you so love this world. When I say we pray together, you would say, God, you so love this world. There will be several stanzas that you can join in, as well as a certain point later on where there will be space to pray for specific concerns, specific people that might be on your mind this morning. Gracious and generous God, lover of this planet and all its people, thank you for creating a home in which we can live, move, and have our being. We pray together, God, you so love this world. Thank you for your spirit that breathes in each of us and holds us in your care from the moment of our birth until we breathe our last. We pray together, God, you so love this world. Thank you for giving us companions with whom we share our lives, creatures, family, and friends, neighbors and strangers, and even enemies. We pray together, God, you so love this world. Thank you for giving us Jesus who shows us your face, who brings us home to you, and who draws us more deeply into your unimaginable mercy, justice, and grace. We pray together, God, you so love this world. We pray for members of our congregation and the world. We pray together, God, you so love this world. We pray for those who are hurt, and suffering injustice by hateful words and actions that fail to recognize your face in the face of the other. Give us courage to speak your love, your desire for reconciliation and understanding in these troubled times. Challenge us to extend your love to those who are living out of narrow perspectives and fear of others, that we might invite them into a broader space of welcome and acceptance. We pray together, God, you so love this world. I invite you also into this prayer of confession. And the words will be on the screen here in a moment. That uh, Feel free to, to read along with them also. God, you call us to a ministry of reconciliation and send us as your ambassadors into the world, yet we are not prepared to do this work. And so in confession we pray. We confess that we get in the way of your reconciling work in our world. Our words are often spoken with disrespect and violence. We want others to yield to our viewpoints. We hang on to our grudges. Our actions often hurt the people and creatures that you love. We fail to see your image in the people with whom we disagree. Our patience falters when the work of restoring relationships gets hard. God, we pray for the Spirit of Jesus to work among us these next weeks. Open our minds, hearts, and spirits that we may grow in maturity and humility. Prepare us to take up the work of reconciliation for the sake of this world that you so love. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I'm the senior pastor at Lowellville Mennonite Church. Wondering if there's any country music fans out there. And if so, what would you say is the perfect country song? Well, according to Ray Benson, who's a musician himself, he says it's this one, The Carroll County Accident, written by Bob Ferguson, performed by Porter Wagner, and he's got that gritty country look about him, doesn't he? What makes this the perfect country song? Well, let's just say there's enough betrayal and tragedy and plot twists and car wrecks and sordid details in it that makes it the perfect country song. What is the best parable to put to a country song? Well, that's an easy one. That would be the parable of the prodigal son that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And it's the parable for our topic this morning, which is reconciliation with God. All kinds of songs have been written about prodigal sons and prodigal daughters returning home after leaving under unpleasant circumstances. One such song is a young man riding on a train, and he has written ahead to his parents. He said, I don't know if you'll take me back, but if you will, hang a white sheet outside so I can see it when I come back. And if it's not there, I won't stop. I'll stay on the train. And as the train gets closer, the young man can't bear to look, and he asks the passenger next to him, can you look in that yard for me and see if there's anything white hanging there? And the passenger looks and says, son, there's white everywhere. Every sheet and white tablecloth and white thing in that house is hanging out in the backyard. And that's the happy ending to the story. The prodigal son was welcomed back home. Our daughter's coming home this weekend. She's not a prodigal daughter, but I decided to film this segment of our morning service in front of her awards bookcase, so to say. And uh, she's always welcome. And we're not going to kill the fatted calf for her, but I know we're going to have a special meal when she arrives here. There's a second part to this parable that the songs don't often talk about, and that is the reaction of the older brother who didn't leave home, who stayed with the father. He's not real happy that the father is welcoming the son back with open arms and is going to have a feast for him, and he says so. And the father says to him, son, you have been with me all this time. Everything that I have is yours already, but this boy has been lost and now has been found, let's have a celebration. These are the three parables of lostness in Luke chapter 15 that Jesus talks about. And I happen to think that Luke 15 is the greatest chapter in all of Scripture because of these three parables. The first one, Connie's already mentioned about the lost sheep, where the farmer has 99 sheep. And he leaves the 99 alone and puts a mask on so it won't harm the one sheep. That, oh, wait, that's not right. He leaves the 99 and goes and finds that one lost sheep and then rejoices when he finds it. And then the next parable is about the woman who has 10 silver coins and she lost one. Does she not search her house until she finds it? And when she finds it, she rejoices. Kind of like me when I was looking for the title to our car. We had a car that Connie and I really liked. Unfortunately, a couple of deer liked it too. One ran out in front of it and the other one ran into the side of it. And the car was damaged so badly that the insurance company said, we will send you the money for the value of the car because it's going to cost more to fix it than what the car is worth. But we need the title to the car. I could not find it anywhere. And I looked and I looked. Finally! I went down into our basement and started looking in some boxes. Now, if you haven't been in our basement lately, there's a real chance you could get lost down there and never come back. I was going through some boxes, and I found the title to the car. And I remember my reaction. I went, yes, just like that. And I ran upstairs, and I said, Connie, rejoice with me. I have found the car title, which was lost. Well, I didn't quite say that, but I did let her know excitedly that I had found it and now we can mail in the title and get the settlement for the car. Rejoicing in things that are lost, but nothing is worth rejoicing as much as a person, a son or a daughter that we have not seen and that we didn't know would ever return and now comes back. That is cause for rejoicing. The second part of this parable, though, which it talks about the reaction of the older brother, which was not a positive reaction. That's me. I'm the older brother. I think Jesus was directing that at his audience. It says the scribes and the Pharisees were grumbling because Jesus liked to eat and fellowship with sinners and tax collectors. 
And so he was saying that their reaction was not very good, kind of like the older brothers, and it was not the right reaction. Which raises an interesting question. Is the church for sinners or is it for saints? Is it for Christians or is it for non-Christians? My personal experience has been that generally the way we do church these days, it's for the saints, it's for the Christians. Those are the activities that we do. We hope that non-Christians will be attracted to it, but we don't really have too many activities that sinners or non-Christians would find attractive. And so I wonder if this parable might also be a lesson that we might need to change the way that we do things. At any rate, Jesus told this parable, and it gives us the opportunity to understand the unquenchable appetite that God has to be with us, to fellowship with us, to find us, and that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who was lost than the 99 who have been there all along. There's something else in these parables that I want to point out. Kenneth Bailey is a Greek scholar, and he has done a lot of work as to how these parables have been constructed and the form in which they go and the order of the sentences. And he has determined that the poetic structure of these parables is such that the middle verse of each parable is the key one in each of these three stories. So, what are those three? In Luke chapter 15, verse 5, when the shepherd goes to find the sheep, the very middle of the story says, when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. In the parable of the lost coin, when the woman finds her coin, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, I have found that which was lost. And in the middle of the parable of the prodigal son, it's verses 11 through 32. So verses 22 and 23, the middle the father says to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, get the fatted calf, let us eat and celebrate. In all three parables, there's rejoicing and celebration. And I think that's instructive for how we can be as the church today. How much rejoicing and celebrating do we do in God's presence? One of the questions that is asked for this morning is, what is your image of God now compared to the image that you had of God as a child? Well, my image of God as a child was a bit like one of my parents. He was watching over my shoulder all the time and ready to punish me if I didn't behave. My father had a very clever way, and I think it came from his career as a school teacher. He could kind of look out the side of his eyes and make it look like he was looking somewhere else, but he was looking right at you. He had told me many times as a youngster, when church is over, don't run around in the parking lot. It's too close to the street. I don't want you getting wild out there. Well, I didn't think he was watching because his face was pointed the other way. And so I ran around to my heart's content. And I got punished when we got home. I do remember that part very well. That was a little bit of my image of God when I was growing up. He's always got his eye on you, and no matter where you go, you cannot hide from God. God sees everything you do. Does that sound familiar? But as I got older, I came to an understanding that God loves us and affirms us and rejoices every time we're in his presence. But there's still that little bit that is so afraid that I'm doing something wrong that God just must really be displeased somehow. So I think that step one of reconciliation with God, which is our topic for this morning, is to understand how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, how much he rejoices just the fact that we're living and breathing and in his presence. And that, to me, is greater than any country song could ever summarize. I hope you have a blessed week, folks. Let's celebrate and rejoice together.
Thank you again for joining us this morning for our online worship service. I hope that wherever you are this morning that you can have a sense of peace. Um, maybe you have a chance to go out into a nice spot like this and just enjoy some of God's peaceful creation. Wherever you are and whatever your circumstances and abilities, I will send you all off with this benediction. As Christians united with Christ, we are called to participate in God's reconciling work in our world. We offer ourselves as servants of God's peace who will listen with the ears and heart of God, speak God's forgiveness, mercy, justice, and grace, lead with God's strong yet tender compassion, and reflect God's steadfast love and kindness. May you experience these things this week. Mm -hmm.